announced that at last we had found the patriarchs in history. Turns out it was a mistaken reading, <laughs> and the date is off anyway. And uh, now that we know more about the site uh, of Ebla in North Syria, we can't make that connection either. Now what I want to do is to turn to the slides and show you some of the things we've been talking about in rather rapid fashion, and then come back to the end to, to ask the question of whether there is indeed any history that we can recover archaeologically from these stories as we have them in the Hebrew Bible. And at the end, we'll have time perhaps for some questions or two. So let us go now to some illustrations. I want to deal with what we call the Fertile Crescent. That is that long arch of green uh, surrounding the desert, uh, stretching all the way from the Arabian Persian Gulf at the right lower part of the screen, up through the Tigris Euphrates valleys, up through Syria, down into the Orontes valleys in Syria and Lebanon, down into the Jordan Valley in Israel and Jordan. And of course, it is back and forth along that crescent that pastoral nomads have always ranged not settling in the river valleys as agriculturalists or urbanites, but rather pursuing a pastoral lifestyle, moving seasonally with their flocks. And they move particularly in the fringe zone between the green and the brown here. That is to say in the area of four to eight inches of annual rainfall, which is too little to sustain crops, but is adequate for pasture land. So it's clear the biblical stories are set along the fringes of the Fertile Crescent. That much is realistic, and nomads are still to be seen in those areas today, as we will note in a moment. Now, if you go to Syria today, or Iraq, or Iran, you still see uh, modern cities on the uh, remains of ancient walled cities, but yet in the uh, shadow of the city walls, you still see uh, farmers and nomads. And these various lifestyles have coexisted from very early times. So again, the descriptions of town life and of urban life in the Bible are, are realistic on the basis of what we know. On the outskirts of Baghdad, which I wouldn't recommend visiting just at the moment, uh, you will see the remains of ancient Sumerian temples dating before 3000 BC. In other words, already there were flourishing urban civilizations in Mesopotamia at least 1500 years before the Bible places Abraham there. Here you see a modern reconstruction of one of these ancient Sumerian temples, monumental architecture dating before 3000 BC. Here's an artist's notion of what one of these temple complexes looked like. It's not only a temple, it's a scribal school, uh, it's a commercial district. Uh, perhaps a third of the population and a third of the domestic uh, product went into the temple and the temple economy and the society. In other words, religion was at the very heart of these early Mesopotamian city-states long before the time of an Abraham. Here's another artist's notion of the reconstruction of life at Ur, and this is a banquet scene. In the background, notice you see the ziggurat, the stepped temple tower. This, of course, reminds you of the story in Genesis 11 of the building of the Tower of Babel, and scholars have long pointed that out. Now, that happens still to stand, and here it is, partly reconstructed on the basis of Sir Leonard Woolley's excavations. Uh, my wife and I once spent one night camping on top of this, and nearly died both from dysentery and from a dust storm that came up. But this is the ziggurat, and it dates already at least 2300 BC. Again, uh, 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 Mesopotamia, southern Mesopotamia was not a backwater if there was an age of Abraham in the early second millennium. Already there were gods and goddesses everywhere, uh, cults of all kinds flourished. Uh, the texts that we have, if they're not economic, almost certainly deal with religious life. Uh, so, an Abraham living in Ur would have been very familiar with Mesopotamian polytheistic religions. The gods were almost always paired, and yet it was a new and different god who appears to him uh, in the biblical stories. Now, uh, among the other innovations of Sumerian uh, and Akkadian civilization in Mesopotamia was writing. And here we see an artist's notion of a scribal school. Uh, young men are learning to write in cuneiform using styli and writing on clay. And indeed, we have a vast amount of literature from the ancient Near East. Here, for example, is a cuneiform document. This is the famous Babylonian flood account, which is very similar to the flood story we have in the Hebrew Bible. Astonishingly similar, and yet it has to be at least a thousand years older. So we're dealing with a literate society. In other words, if there was an Abraham living there at the time, he would not have been a country bumpkin. He might have been an educated person and a sophisticated, worldly person. There was a great deal of wealth in these cities. This is now in the Philadelphia University Museum, and part of the uh, 
uh, royal cemetery that Woolley excavated, a lovely uh, harp uh, in lapis lazuli and gold. Uh, it was found in a tomb in which a queen was buried with 67 of her servants who had probably been slaughtered to accompany her in death. So we have a wealthy and complex, highly stratified society in Ur, the very city mentioned in the stories. Here, however, we see that not everybody was an elite. Uh, there were some people who were just trying to get by, more or less as the middle class is today, uh, and they, they took their sorrows out on an occasional party. Uh, and this is a party scene. They're drinking beer uh, from a typical uh, Acadian jar with a long straw. We actually have artistic representations, and we have the recipes for making the beer. I've tried it. It's not really very good, but uh, it was the best they had. So we can reconstruct life in the city of Urs in surprising detail at all levels of society as the result of archaeological excavations over nearly 100 years now.